Well, look, I've got 10.02 on my clock uh, central time. Yep. So Beth, why don't you kick us off? Okay, well, just, okay. I feel like I should have like a gong or something. Like just welcome everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in for our very first ever succinct seminar series, getting the alliteration in there. So, you know, usually this time of year, you know, Oyster South, we come together somewhere on the East Coast or on the Gulf Coast and, you know, get together, socialize, do the presentations, get some science in, get some learning in. And we were really hopeful for, you know, now, but I mean, as you all know, we just kind of roll with it. So we miss you. Yes, we <laughs> totally miss everybody. So I cannot even tell you what joy it brings me to see everyone's faces. Like it's just fantastic. So thank you so much um, for joining us. So, you know, bearing that in mind, um, we wanted to bring something to the community that was of value, um, but also not kind of overdo it with, a, you know, another video call that lasted all day or even half a day. So that's really where the concept of having, you know, a, a meaningful, short, succinct, one hour, once a month, we thought, okay, you know, that's pretty manageable, hopefully for most people. And even if you, you know, somebody you know could not make it on today, we are recording this so that way we will have it available later um, on our website and I mean maybe on the Auburn Shellfish Lab page but you know definitely Oyster on the Oyster South um, web page for sure. So um, you know Bill already mentioned just to keep yourselves muted. Um, well, I just I just add you know um, when we've done the symposium yes. like um, for those who aren't familiar with Oyster South, Oyster South is a nonprofit, a charitable foundation dedicated to advancing oyster aquaculture through the southern U.S. Um, and so it's not a growers uh, lobbying organization. Yeah. There are some growers lobbying organizations and we encourage growers to join that. But one thing I've loved about Oyster South is that it really brings together everybody. growers and chefs. restaurateurs and chefs and wholesalers and gear suppliers. Students, right? And Scientists, students. extension agents, kind of everybody who's interested in oysters. Really. But when we do this, what we found is when we asked for feedback at the symposium, I forget, have we done four, three? Anyway, when we do the symposium, you know, I'm, I'm a scientist and so I'm excited about the science and the applied research that gets presented but when we ask for feedback it turns out that you guys all say that you really like the getting together Parties. and the partying and <laughs> the social time um, so what we wanted to do is um, really make sure that the scientists only had a limited amount of time to talk um, and so that there's some time for you to see each other and talk and that's also for the other seminar series you want me to go into what those will be uh, sure and I mean just the overline just real quick like the theme of kind of our seminar series was and Becky Watson, thank you for this inspiration, was unity in community, you know, just trying to bring everybody together, even if it's not in the same way that we typically do. We just wanted this to be a reminder to folks that, you know, we're we're here, we're still going, you know, and please remember to, you know, reach out to anybody that you would like at any time, because we'd always love to talk to you. So, you know, with that, I know Bill was going to announce the other ones, the other seminars coming up. Yeah, so uh, uh, obviously today, then on Friday, March 19th, we're going to do um, two things. We'll have a panel on sustainable packaging. So we've lined up some speakers to talk about some innovative ideas for sustainable packaging when we ship oysters. And then doing uh, some three-minute tech talks. That's one of the highlights of the symposium is getting people to talk about practical innovations on farms different and, things but making making yeah. sure that you New do that in three minutes yeah and then um on friday april 16th we're going to have a conversation about diversity and inclusion in aquaculture and thinking about that as an opportunity in oyster south as we go forward so we're going to have try to have a, a uh, productive conversation about that on in april we may have others i know that there are a lot of other institutions that have some great research and so if there's interest in this and this is successful we're going to go ahead and probably schedule more of these yes yeah, so. so we're going to see how it goes you know and um, just kind of roll with it so bill thanks um the other while y'all are kind of scribbling down dates or if you get your calendars open Right now, um, we're announcing here first to save the date of Sunday, Oct October 24th, I've got it right, in Decatur, Georgia for our annual landlocked fundraiser. So as you all know, I mean, things are always changing. Um, this could change, but we really thought it was important to kind of have something on the calendar for people to look forward to. Um, you know, and this really was inspired by the, the folks up at the Billion Oyster Project. Um, they also know that, you know, they're in the same situation, but they thought it was important for people to have a date, you know, make an announcement, have something to look forward to. So y'all tell your friends, put it on your calendars, 
for Sunday, October 24th. So, and of course, um, we'll keep everybody posted and we'll make an official announcement over the summer, like when we usually do when we open up ticket sales. Um, and I think, oh, okay, we've got what, a few minutes? So, well, I'll just, yes. so quickly, you know, um, hopefully people saw in the newsletter that we announced that um, I've taken a position at the Virginia okay. Institute of Marine Science uh, beginning in June. That's a very tough decision uh, for, for us to make. We, we uh, spent a lot of time talking about that. I love the work we've done on the Gulf Coast, love the people uh, that we work with on the Gulf Coast, um, but it, it was a unique opportunity. It's a great team of people up there, great industry there as well, and um, quite a bit closer to um, our parents, both of whom are, all of whom are getting older. Yeah. Um, We're so, not getting older. They're getting older. But the good news out of that is that I would still like to work with growers throughout the Southeast. Uh, and I know that Beth was asked by the board to stay on. Yes. So, so. Um, so Oyster yes, South yes, will continue um, in its current version um, going forward. So I don't want anybody to be concerned that that, that is going away. Um, with that, we're going to get to the speakers. And so just certainly if people want to use the, anybody that's used Zoom, you can uh, type uh, messages in the chat box. That won't, that won't distract um, yep. from speakers. If you want to do that, you can put questions or comments in there. Emojis. Emojis, if you like. When we get to the um, questions, there's, um, you can either actually physically wave your hands and, and uh, nice. Rusty can unmute you. Um, or there is a reactions in the lower right of your screen where you can click on that and you can raise your hand. Um, and if you raise your hand that way, Rusty would know that, that you have a question. Um, you can also just type it in the chat and we'll repeat it. All right, I think with that, Beth, you're gonna go okay. ahead. Okay, yes. So I'm gonna introduce, I'm very happy to introduce our very first speaker, Brendan Campbell, who is a native of New Jersey and went to Rutgers as an undergraduate studying biological oceanography. And then he focused on plankton distribution in the Antarctic. Talk about cold, my gosh. Um, and then worked for, let's see, the Haskin Shellfish Research Laboratory. And then after that, he worked in several commercial oyster and clam farms and realized, gosh, there's a lot of questions here. Right, Brendan? Like there's so many questions when you start working in places like that. And he decided to focus um, as a graduate student at the University of Maryland, studying how water movement affects the production of cultured oysters. And a fun fact about Brendan, as much as he likes seafood and oysters, he loves to garden. So with that, I'm gonna <laughs> hand it over to Mr. Brendan Campbell. There Thanks, go, Brendan. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, let me just share my screen. So again, my name is Brendan Campbell. I am a researcher at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. And today I want to just talk about um, how oysters are a product of their physical environment. Um, so what usually what we think about is oysters as a product of their environment is something along the lines of their Miroir or that relationship they have with the water they're connected with, you know, things like the salinity or the temperature or just the mineral that are in the water and how that affects their taste. Uh, well, our research is trying to look at how wave move motion and cage, how that affects cage jostling and things like that, and how that can affect production standards for oysters. So this is some of our preliminary work. Um, so, you know, one of the benefits to oyster aquaculture is that it requires no feed or nutrient inputs during the grow out phase, which is really helpful for the industry. But at the same rate, we are, um, what drives food delivery is natural water flow. And we're kind of at the mercy of the environment to provide that. And while we have a good understanding of that basic relationship between food delivery and oyster growth, we don't necessarily know how that's affected in the context of an oyster cage or on a farm, how just the meshes and the pylons and all of these elements affect the water movement and then can affect feeding. So what we're working on is to try to understand these elements inside cages and how that can influence production. At the same rate, another important um, metric in the industry is looking at the shape quality of an oyster, how deep and cup is and you know how you can get it out to market. And devices like these tumblers, they not only 
sort and clean sh um, the shells and bring them out to market, but they also chip the exterior of the shell and help to drive that deep in cup formation that helps get a better dollar for your product. Uh, well, wave energy, waves and you know, that crashing boat and uh, wave velocity and all of that stirring up in the water can also have a similar effect that you see with these tumblers just on a longer term scale, on a more natural scale, but we don't have the means to sort of quantify that at this moment. So some of the work that we're starting with is trying to develop tools that can be placed inside oyster cages and structures so that we can start to identify what physical processes are going on in the water with respect to all of this aquaculture gear and how that influences the growth and quality of oysters. So two of these tools are working on, one is a clod card, which is this plaster ball that you can put in the water. And then um, as water is moving past it, it dissolves. So you can measure the change in weight of the card before and after the deployment, and you can get a sense of how water is moving through your cages. The same rate we have accelerometers. This picture one is um, designed by onset hobo loggers and these continuously can log the movement of oysters and cages in gear. Um, and they're roughly the weight and size of an adult oyster tissue. So you can even put them inside of an oyster shell like this picture here and you get this Frankenstein oyster that can sit inside of your cage I can tell you a lot about what's going on inside your cage at any given like five minute interval, which is really powerful for understanding you know, how water movement is affecting the, the shell chipping rate of the oysters and then, uh, ultimately how quickly they're going to grow, how they're going to look. It can really start to help figure out what your, uh, how your oysters are going to look by the time they're finished growing. And at the same rate, it also tells you how these grow on an individual lease scale. So you can take these devices, put them out on your specific farm. It can give you guidance on how to best manage the operations on your specific lease or between one lease compared to another, depending on its own physical characteristics. Uh, so using these tools, we, we did two case studies that I'm just gonna kind of briefly show you some of the hypothetical you know, what we're starting to find out with these. Um, the first case study was just looking at the difference in culture methods, you know, bottom cages versus long lines versus floating cages, seeing how the presence of these cages affect the physical environment and then affect the growth and quality of the oysters they're in. So while we're still working on this project, um, I have some of the preliminary results. So, so what we did for this, project was we grew out oysters for about a growing season, uh, I think six to eight, six months, and put in these accelerometers, these um, clod cards, and then monitored the growth metrics over time. Uh, so what we're starting to pick out without um, offhand is this relationship between cage jostling, which is the motion of the cage, how it's moving around, we're starting to see this relationship between the frequency of jostling, how often this uh, is occurring, and then how intense it is, how strong of a jostling event is occurring. So what we're seeing is, at least on our farm now, to mention just at our pretty low flow environment at our demonstration farm at Horn Point Lab, uh, we're seeing that the long line systems that we deployed, you know, they're seeing a lot of jostling, but they're not seeing it at a whole lot of intensity. So as a result, the oysters growing in those cages are growing a lot more tissue than, or a lot more meat than some of the other cage methods at the, at the uh, cost of their shell growth rate and their shape. Um, on the other hand, you have the floating cages, which, you know, if they sit on the top, they're more exposed to wave energy. So, you're, um, you know, as they're jumping up and down, you're getting more intense jostling events but they're not occurring quite as often as you're seeing with uh, some of these long line systems, at least according to our data. Uh, and from that, we're seeing that these cages are growing better quality shapes than some of the other systems um, at the cost of shell growth and meat wave. And then we have bottom cages, which, you know, they sit at the bottom, not too much is going on there. They're not affected by quite as much wave energy. So, 
we're seeing faster shell growth, which can essentially get through the market faster, but at the cost of a flatted, a more flattened oyster shape and lower tissue growth. Um, and those sort of trade-offs, when we look at our second case study, you'll see are kind of also coming through. Um, so in this case study, we looked at biofouling and how the effects of biofouling treatment can change the growth of, or can change the physical environment and then the growth of oysters therein. So we deployed long line cages for two months. We used, again, our clock cards and our accelerometers to see how the physical environment was changing as biofouling was accumulating. And then we saw how the growth changed again. So what we observed here was again, another trade-off that when we looked at desiccated oysters versus non-desiccated oysters, the oysters that were taken care of as they were accumulating this fouling, you were starting to see that the cages were moving around less uh, and the oysters there inside were moving around less. And that created this response change of the oysters uh, that ultimately can affect their quality. So with the desiccated oysters, we're seeing again, more tissue growth, higher quality oysters, but they weren't growing their shell length as fast as the more fouled oysters, so they weren't getting to market quite as fast. So there's that sort of market trade-off there. Um, and while, and as we're doing these experiments, we're starting to pick apart more in detail these trade-offs, we're gonna try to start to quantify these as we continue on doing these experiments. Um, and with that, I'd love to take any questions you might have. Uh, if we don't get to you, feel free to email me at my email or follow me on Twitter for research updates and yeah thank you and, and Brendan, Brendan somebody's already found the the applaud emoji so that's great um uh, Keller <laughs> wanted to know if you evaluated oyster grow or a catch them style cage versus a go deep floating cage um so for that I used an oyster grow cage and then the the long line cages were SIPAs and I just used a two by three Virginia style cage Gotcha. And, but, I and then I just want to also make sure that this was done for my farm. It could be different for a different farm. So the, you know, the practicality of these tools is to deploy them in different areas to make sure that um, these trade-offs are, you know, specific to each farm. Sure. Um, David Sorrell wanted to know, what about the volume um, of the amount of oysters uh, per cage? So, um, I, I think that might be asking, what's your stocking density? Um, there are different ways to measure that, but how many oysters did you have per cage? Uh, I stocked them fairly light because I didn't want, just for the experiment, I didn't want to have to remove oysters by the end of the experiment. Um, for the biofouling experiment, I just did market standard. I think 20% uh, of the cages volume uh, for the other experiment. I did, I think, half of the cage recommendations. Um, so they probably were filled about 10% of the volume. And then they were kept there for the whole growing season. So towards the end, they were starting to fill out. Okay. And then uh, Keller followed up with, uh, what was the time difference between the harvest for oysters that came from clean cages versus oysters that came from fouled cages? You had that graphic that showed there was a, a trade-off there, but approximately what was that at your site? So, that study was done over two months. So what we did, and I didn't show this today, is we kind of extrapolated the, the growth rate of the oysters to try to predict the time to market. But we're actually seeing that there is about a two to three month different based on this like back of the envelope sort of rough calculation. Um, there's a, on the scale of a month or so of getting to like of your average size getting to market. And I guess uh, approximately how long does it normally take to get to market just because that varies throughout our region here like so for, like what is the approximate time where you're at? Um, at our farm, I think it'll take uh, gosh, I want to say about two two years for a, a pretty for a majority of the cohort to be to go through. So knocking a month off of that is not insignificant for sure. Uh, All right we yeah. got. One other sorry, question here. I was thinking, I'm sorry, what? One, one other question here is how, how big was the seed when the experiment was deployed? And then I think we'll move on to Adrienne. Okay. So I, I started the seed off at approximately 30 centimeters on average for all for 
both experiments, if I remember correctly, to try to see when they would get to market. Yeah. All right. Great. Great. If you could Thanks, stop sharing Brandon. your screen. There you go. And then uh, get, uh, I'll some, let you do some intros. Some shout outs for the graphs are great. <laughs> People are loving it. So thank you so much. All right. So we are going to move on to our second speaker, Dr. Adrienne Michaelis, and her brief but exciting biography, her background. She's a native. Now, I'm, hopefully, I'm not going to get it wrong. Mich, Michigander, right? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> bachelor's of science in anthropology and zoology from the university of michigan a master of science in marine biology from unc wilmington where we were last year yes <laughs> and a phd in anthropology from the university of maryland I'm seeing a pattern here university of maryland <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly before returning to school for her phd adrienne worked in an oyster research lab at university of maryland that focused on oyster restoration monitoring in maryland Currently, she's a postdoc at the Auburn University Shellfish Lab. And her fun fact, before entering the world of oysters, she worked for the National Audubon Society and spent many days canoeing the swamps of North Carolina in search of the ivory-billed woodpecker. And rumor has it, she can still be seen in old episodes of Exploring North Carolina in a very fashionable all camo ensemble. So with that, I am happy to introduce Adrienne and she's going to be speaking about her most important work today. Thanks, Adrienne. All right. Thanks, Beth. Let me get the screen share going here. And hopefully we don't crash the internet. Um, all right. And All right, so you guys should see the full slide. Is that good? Good. All right. Um, so first, thanks for giving me the chance to talk today. And I'm presenting a hopefully succinct snapshot of some of my dissertation research, which many Oyster South members contributed to. And so my work focuses on the non-physical environment, and I focus on cultural ecosystem services. And so I wanted to give a very brief overview of ecosystem services. Most oyster farmers are familiar with them because their oysters provide many, but ecosystem services are the benefits that people obtain from ecosystems. And they're grouped into four different types. The regulating and supporting services are what we think of as the environmental benefits. So oysters filter the water and contribute to water clarity. They provide habitat, which protects adjacent shorelines, also provides habitat for animals and oyster farming gear does the same. There's also provisioning services, which is more the, the raw materials, the direct products. So the oyster meat that you eat, the shells that get used for other purposes. But I focus on the cultural services. And so these ones um, haven't gotten as much attention. They're the non-material benefits. I use a more recent definition. So when I talk about cultural services, I'm thinking about them as the interaction between environmental spaces and cultural practices to produce cultural benefits. And so another way of thinking about this is a cultural practice like farming oysters in a place like Grand Bay, Alabama, for example, produces cultural benefits. And these benefits take the shape of identities, experiences, and capabilities. And so these are all things that contribute to human well being. And why did I choose to focus on cultural services? Well, they're understudied relative to those other benefits. But they're important. Other work has shown, especially in fishing based communities, that cultural services are more tangible, more salient to people than some of these environmental benefits. And in some of my other work in Maryland, I showed that for folks entering oyster aquaculture, cultural services were more important motivators. And I'll point out that even though income is a cultural benefit, I didn't include income in this study, and cultural services were still overwhelmingly um, more prevalent than other types of services. And so we know that they're important, but we don't really know much about them. So what cultural services do we get from oysters? And so with my dissertation, I aimed in one of the studies to actually just detail what these benefits are. So what are the cultural benefits enabled through work with shellfish? And then I'm also interested in the relationship between wild fisheries and farm shell fisheries. I wanted to know if shellfish aquaculture can provide the same types of benefits as a wild fishery. Wild fisheries are known for having high associated job satisfaction for the individuals that take part in it. They also contribute to both individual and community well-being and are related to community heritage. So I wanted to know if shellfish farming can do that same thing. And so to answer this, 
And this is where um, many Oyster South folks got involved. I um, took on field work in three different sites in New England, well, multiple sites, three different regions, in New England, the Chesapeake Bay, and Gulf of Mexico, using methods of participant observation. So participant observation is essentially learning while doing. I went and worked with oyster farmers, worked with clam farmers, worked with wild harvesters in all of these places. And I also interviewed participants. So I interviewed 218 folks using semi-structured interviews. And so with these, I had a, a set of questions that targeted the benefits from folks' work, what you like about your work, what are some of the good things. And then for a subset of folks who were interested, I did photo voice interviews. So these photo voice interviews were similar in that I asked people to think about the benefits they get from their work and what they like about it, but to take pictures. And then they would come back and discuss the pictures when we met again. And so in doing this, I worked with um, folks that were making an income from shellfish in different ways. So majority were commercial shellfish growers. And I focused specifically on people making an income rather than um, folks that might be growing shellfish recreationally. I also worked with wild harvesters and then a third group of industry support. And these were people who were making an income because of shellfish, but not necessarily commercially producing or harvesting shellfish. They might be research scientists, resource managers, gear manufacturers, or extension agents um, as a few examples. And you'll see that the numbers add up to more than 218. That's because a number of participants were involved in multiple roles. So they may have been both wild harvesters and commercial shellfish growers. And so I took all of these interviews and all the text that um, was generated through these and analyzed them to identify the benefits that were enabled through work with shellfish. And in total, I have a list of 46 benefits. 31 of these benefits are cultural benefits, but there was also provisioning, uh, regulating and supporting services also included. Today, I'm only presenting the cultural benefits in order to stick to my allotted time. Um, and in addition to just listing them, I'm also paying attention to how frequently they were mentioned, which ones were potentially more important based on frequency, and then how they might change. And so I had questions that specifically targeted how these benefits differed between a wild shell fishery and farmed. And so I'll go through these cultural benefits and don't have time to go through each of them, but I do want to um, make mention of each of the high frequency ones. So on this slide and the next two, I have it separated by these three different categories of cultural benefit. First identities, then experiences, then capabilities. And the ones that are shown in yellow were mentioned by more than 60 participants. So these are what I've deemed high frequency based on my data. And I also wanna make a note that all the pictures framing this slide and the next two are photos that were provided by participants as part of the photo voice exercise. So they're used here with their permission, but each of these photos represents the benefits that are on the slide. So they, they use these photos to talk about one or multiple of these benefits. So in thinking about cultural benefits related to identities, the one that was high frequency was contribution to community. So people talked about how they valued the fact that their work was providing jobs in the community. It was a means for people to, to stay and continue to work in their hometown rather than have to leave to find work. It also helped sustain working waterfronts. So it helped keep fisheries alive, even if it may be in a different, a different shape or a different type of fishery than what historically has been there. People also talked about the different experiences enabled by work with shellfish. And so four of these were high frequency experiences. Um, the first, independence. Usually something that we think of when we think of wild fisheries, a lot of folks that become commercial fishermen or women do so because they value that independence and the ability to have sort of control of their day. And this was the same for shellfish farmers. There was a sense of control, a sense of freedom associated with the work. People talked about the lifestyle. So being out in the environment, being on the water and sort of the pace that was involved with their work um, was something beneficial. They also talked about security. And this was one of the benefits that was often mentioned relative to wild harvest. So for a lot of people that had done both wild harvest and farmed oysters or um, had transitioned into one, they felt that farming was a little bit more secure, a little bit more predictable than wild harvest was. And then the last one was social capital. And so this just means the relationships that are built. So people valued the fact that they were making these connections with other people, whether it was through a community like Oyster South was, was mentioned in multiple interviews, or with the people that they're selling their oysters to, with their coworkers, these human relationships were important to people. And then finally, 
Uh, the last category, which is capabilities. So this is a shorter list, but people talked about income. So obviously farming oysters, it's a job. You wanna make money. But most of the oyster growers on here probably know that there are easier ways to make a buck than starting a shellfish farm. But it was a way to make income while staying on the water, for example, or working with a family member, having your own business, or a way to make income while providing these environmental benefits at the same time. So I did see that a lot of these benefits were linked, which I go into in my dissertation more, um, but won't delve into that today. And also people talked about knowledge as a capability that was uh, enabled through work. And that was not only the things that were being learned by the work, but also the ability to share that. So it was important not only that they were gaining knowledge, but they were also able to pass it on to others. And then finally, the other thing that I'll, I'll focus on today, these idea of, of benefits changing with transition from a wild fishery into shellfish aquaculture. So I had questions that specifically asked how these benefits might change. And from responses, I found that of the 46 benefits, 12 were recognized as about equal between the two. So there wasn't a change between a wild fishery or farm um, oysters. 12 were enhanced with shellfish aquaculture and many of the environmental benefits, those regulating and supporting services fell into this category. Only two were recognized across the boards as potentially dis diminished. And one was a sense of adventure. So the thrill of, a hunt, a thrill of the hunt associated with a wild fishery wasn't found in shellfish aquaculture. Um, if you do have that thrill of the hunt, then maybe you're not doing it right. But for most of the people that had worked wild fisheries, that was something that they were okay with because they appreciated that security or stability that they got. The other was aesthetic appreciation, which was interesting because it was from not necessarily the participants own perspective, but how they thought that a person outside of the industry, like an upland property owner might view um, shellfish farming. But many of the benefits, so 20 of them, were discussed both as enhanced and diminished. So what this showed me that depending on perspective, people have very different views how these benefits, and most of these were cultural benefits, but how they changed was affected by one's viewpoint. And so for anyone on here that helped out with the online survey that took place last spring, um, where you kind of did a bizarre game of solitaire online, that's what I investigated with that study, which I won't present today, but delving more into the values that are underlying these different viewpoints. And so just to sum up, two questions I set out today are, what are the cultural benefits enabled through work with shellfish? Well, I found that there are many, and this project created the first detailed list of cultural ecosystem services associated with shellfish. And can shellfish aquaculture provide the same types of benefits as a wild fishery? Um, my data suggests that yes, for the most part it can, and we did see that perspectives vary, but shellfish aquaculture does have the potential to provide similar benefits which, with a small number of exceptions. And so then taking this step one step further, uh, what sort of implications? So we know that there's all these good things. If you're farming oysters, you know what you like about it. So what, what can we do with that? Having these data provides an expanded list of benefits to highlight the values of shell fisheries. So in areas where maybe those environmental benefits haven't won over the hearts of upland property owners, for example, perhaps providing this human connection can or at least can help do that. It also provides a better understanding of shellfish farming's ability to match the cultural role of a wild fishery, particularly in areas where wild fisheries may not be as strong as they once were. We can now see how shellfish aquaculture can maybe step in there. And then for resource managers, it just highlights the importance of considering multiple stakeholder perspectives as, you, as you're thinking about um, the progress of, of each type of fishery moving forward. And with that, um, I I might have a time for a question or two, but provided my email here, adrian at auburn.edu, and just want to thank everyone that contributed to it. Great. Thanks, awesome. Adrian. Thanks, Adrian. That's great. Um, does anybody have any questions for Adrian? I have questions, but I'll save them for later. <laughs> well, you know, Adrian, I, I think, you know, one reason I value this work is I do think the cultural ecosystem services are probably, I don't know, you ask a bunch of scientists and we tend to do the environmental impacts. And so, um, but I'm not sure that in communities along the coast that the decisions aren't made more about cultural ecosystem services. So anybody have any questions? Any folks need, uh, I'm sure if you need some documentation of this, um, Adrian has, has got her dissertation and is working on some publications out of this too. That may help with some of folks who are trying to convince uh, 
some of the NIMBYs in their community. Oh, people love seeing all the photos uh, that you put up. We're getting some great comments. So um, one thing I want to ask, but you don't have to answer right now, is just um, I am very interested in knowing what, what you're going to study next. How are you going to build on this? So you can think about that <laughs> for later. Um, and if anybody comes up with any questions, feel free to type them in the chat box. Um, and with that, I think we're going to, thank you, Adrienne, by the way, again, um, we're going to move thank on you. to our next speaker who happens to be sitting right here, Dr. Bill Walton. Um, Bill, for those who don't know him, is the director of the Auburn University Shellfish Lab and a professor in Auburn University School of Fisheries and Extension Specialist with Alabama Cooperative Extension System. And a fun fact about Bill, <laughs> so many um but one that he asked that that we, that we share was that in college um bill was a dj for a college radio station hosting a program called into the midnight blue but that he still cannot get the song lyrics to any songs correct to this day That's true. i'm going to add my own and just say that he won the silver ladle in a chili cook-off contest many years ago so actually not that many years so anyway with that Bill Walton will be talking about oysters, sorry, urchins, oysters, and Roombas. So, Bill. All right. Well, thank you, Beth. And yeah, you know, I like, um, we had uh, shown a brief glimpse of this at the last Oyster South Symposium and wanted to follow up with more, more data on this. So this is, you know, uh, when we present this at something like National Shell Fisheries Association, we would call this effects of co-culture of urchins, Lytokinus spiragatus, with Eastern oysters, Crossosphere virginica, just to make sure it sounds sciencey enough. Um, and then I certainly want to acknowledge that uh, the series of co-authors that helped do this work and, and accomplish this. So um, thank you to, to all those folks. So, you know, urchins, this is an interesting idea. Like obviously one of the, you know, Ag 101 says you should diversify your crops. And so oyster farmers, what do you do? What else could you grow? And, and urchins are a, a fancy seafood item um, that there's been interest in. They can be cultured in a hatchery. They're typically harvested for their roe, which is also called uni. Um, from a culture point of view, they like high salinity. They typically like above 25 parts per thousand. So this is not going to be a solution for Louisiana, Mississippi, or Alabama growers. Um, but um, it was something that we wanted to explore because of possibilities in Florida and Texas. Um, importantly, um, found out as we went, they do not like being desiccated. So um, these are not animals that would want to be air dried like, like your oysters. So that led to this obvious question of can urchins be raised in culture with oysters? Why? Because Dr. Watts up at UAB uh, wants to grow urchins. I'm familiar with growing oysters and, and he can grow these in the lab, but he was looking for field operations. And so we, tr we wanted to take advantage of this idea that there are commercial farms in the water that have potential to grow uh, urchins. So um, can they be raised in these oyster bags? But importantly, if you do that, um, aside from the risk to the farmer of reaching into a bag of oysters that now has urchins in it, um, does culturing urchins with oysters have any significant effect upon the oysters? And here we were really, you know, the premise was we wanted to make sure we were doing no harm. We certainly wouldn't want the addition of urchins um, to, to harm the oysters. And with one year of funding from the Gulf States Marine Fisheries Commission, we were able to do this. And, and before I go to the next slide, I just want you to note that the Vexar bags that we used in this study uh, had a divider down the middle. And so that let us do one half of a bag and the other half. So that, that's important for stocking densities. So what test did we do? We worked with two commercial oyster farms using floating cages in the Florida Panhandle. And those were located in Alligator Harbor and Oyster Bay. We collected urchin juveniles, the native urchin. Uh, they were about uh, an inch, inch and a quarter diameter uh, from St. Joe Bay and we deployed those the next day in October, 2019. And we put those in clean uh, nine millimeter mesh oyster bags. Um, and again, we only, had, we only put about 40 oysters, but that's, that's half a bag. Um, we had three urchin stocking densities. So within each of those units um, with the oysters, we either put zero urchins, four urchins or eight urchins. Um, again, for a full bag, you would double that. As a control, we were concerned that the oysters would actually smash the urchins. So as a control, we did also deploy urchins um, without oysters at three stocking densities. And we did that with two, four, or eight urchins. 
And in March 2020, we went out and we measured urchin performance, oyster performance, and the biofouling on the bags. And you can see in the picture on the left, we got some differences. This is one of those studies that when you did it, um, you knew that the statistics would, would find something because you could just see it with your eyes. So let's start with urchins. So urchin survival was not affected by oyster presence. So that was good. Um, I don't have that graph shown here, um, but I did wanna show you that top graph. The blue bars are Alligator Harbor and the red bars are Oyster Bay. And you can see that across the urchin starting, starting densities that we lost a significant number of urchins at Oyster Bay, but not at Alligator Harbor. That's partly because of the gear at Oyster Bay got tossed around a little bit more, but it may also be because of salinity. Um, all the urchins grew, but the average weight and gonad index did decrease with increasing urchin density. What does that mean? So if you look at this graph, as we went from two, four, and then eight, the gonad quality, the gonad index dropped. And that was true when they were with oysters as well. Um, at uh, Pelican Bay Oyster Company, they um, had some bags with urchins that they, the floating grass in the water, they threw in those bags. And you can see that the urchin gonads did pretty well. Uh, Dr. Watts, a co-author, says that any of the ones that are, these bars at this level are near or at market quality. So that means that urchins have some potential as something that we could grow as a crop. But I wanted to focus today on um, what does it do to the oysters? Well, critically, if you're an oyster farmer, urchins did not affect oyster survival. Um, this is, again, the blue bars are Alligator Harbor and the red bars are Oyster Bay, and you have oyster survival on this axis. That's pretty good oyster survival um, at, at all those sites over five months. We were, we were pleased with that. And they don't affect oyster growth, at least some of them. So if you look at shell height, so this is the longest measurement of the oyster, this is statistically insignificant that all the oysters um, basically grew, but they all grew at about the same rate, regardless of whether they were with urchins or not. So that also didn't affect shell length and didn't affect what we call the fan of the oyster. Okay, so doing no harm. But there turned out to be some benefits. So urchins, when you put urchins uh, with oysters, the oysters, uh, sorry, the oysters that were grown with four or eight urchins had significantly deeper cups, a deeper cupped oyster than ones without urchins. That also meant that urchins produced oysters with heavier shells, urchins produced oysters with greater dry tissue weight. And we used a visual grading system that we adopted for the Pacific oyster in Australia that measures body condition, mantle condition, and shell fullness. Um, and lower score is better there. And sure enough, urchins led to better body condition, led to better mantle condition, and it led to when you opened up the oyster, it just looked fuller as well. So urchins had, had some benefits. Um, I did promise Roombas, so um, uh, first now it won't work, but that's supposed to be a, oh, there you go. That's supposed to be a video of Roombas. Um, and so, which won't actually work at time. But this was this idea of, you know, this idea that we could stock a bag with urchins. Could those urchins act like Roombas um, on the bag? So, and Becky Wasden was kind enough to take this. This is the urchin grazing on an oyster, uh, still, even though it's out of the bag in the water. Um, and then you can see oysters grown without uh, urchins and oysters grown with urchins. That The only difference between these two pictures was whether urchins were grown with those oysters or not. The way we measured that on the oysters was biofouling on the oysters. Um, there are a couple ways to do this. You can scrape off oysters and collect all the fouling material and, and do dry weights. You can look at percent cover on the oyster, but honestly, um, there are a lot of issues with any of those. Um, and so we, the uh, standard that we adopted was how long does it take to clean a standard number of oysters? And I, I've forgotten now if it was 15, I'd have to go back and look if it was 12 or 15 in this. But we have a standard way of cleaning the oyster with a shucking knife and we just time that. And what we saw was that as you added urchins to oysters, four or eight, the amount of time that it took to clean those oysters significantly decreased with each, uh, each level there. So, and it, this was obvious to the eye, but these are the data that backed up that that was a real thing going on. But what about the bags? Um, and this is again, uh, the Roomba analogy here is that, um, you know, if you look at the bags on the left, like we would open up bags and we would, before we even spotted urchins in the bag, we knew if, if it had urchins because the bag on the left was obvious at, um, at least at Alligator Harbor, it was obvious urchins had been cleaning the bag, whereas on the right, they had not. 
this is what that looked like. And this was interesting. And I'm sorry, Oyster Bay, that this was the result. But if you look at the red bars first, and you look at percent fouling of the bag, and so we measured how many squares were blocked on the bag, what percentage was. And so you can see that regardless of urchins, that the basically the fouling did not statistically decrease in the Oyster Bay bags. However, in the bags at Alligator Harbor, as we added four and then eight, we saw significant decreases in how fouled the bags were. So um, the idea of a Roomba, I love, I love the idea that they could actually do that. Our next step are we're gonna do more marketability of the urchins and seeing if that's a viable market um, grown this way. We're hoping to deploy this again with hatchery reared urchins instead of wild collected. Uh, we'd like to test this with smaller oyster seed and also looking at whether urchins control some of those shell boring species like sponges and mudworms. I want to thank John Lewis and Sean Zhang for field assistance and also the entire team at the Shellfish Lab for helping process the samples. Couldn't have done the work without Oyster Boss and Pelican Oyster Company for hosting us. And again, thanks to the Gulf States Marine Fisheries Commission for funding this work. I think with that, I can take any questions. I think I have time. I think you have time. All right. Yeah. Great. I did awesome. the Jersey speed talk. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, the, oh, 10 seconds. All right. <laughs> so, does anybody have any questions? Rusty, I don't know if anybody typed anything in the chat there. I couldn't see that while I was talking. Yeah, there's one. All right. Uh, do you Ooh. think urchins would work in South Carolina? I think it's worth. Uh, I think yes, it's worth. Try it. <laughs> Ooh, maybe that was. Maybe I skipped ahead there. Uh, yeah, sorry, Rusty. I should have let you. Sorry. Um, I'll answer the South Carolina one. I think it's a possibility. I think it's worth exploring. And Rusty, I'll let you do it so I don't mess up the order here. Um, how can we get these? <laughs> uh, uh, urchins, that's a good question. We've been working with uh, Dr. Watts to um, spawn them um, up at UAB in, in Alabama. Uh, but with COVID, that confounded him. So then we tried to partner with some folks in Florida to see if they could raise these so that these could be something that a grower could order and and have on hand were there differences in fouling communities between those two areas yes there were um and i know jackie i see you on the line i know becky i'm trying to remember now it seemed like we had more soft-bodied stuff in alligator harbor it was the more like the tunicates and the um the soft like uh maybe there was a variety of things there whereas it tended to be more barnacles in oyster sorry barnacles and some overset in oyster bay how do you explain the, how do you explain the difference in fouling between locations tested? <laughs> yeah, so that would just go, I think, to that, that there may be some differences in how effective they are in different types of fowlers. The other thing I'd throw in there is that the urchins just weren't as happy in Oyster Bay. And again, there were some reasons for that about how the cages bounced around. But I tried to, we actually, from the statistical analysis, if a bunch of urchins died in a bag that was supposed to have eight and it dropped below six urchins. I actually excluded it from the analysis in terms of its impact on oysters. So we were, for any of the oyster performance metrics, it was confined to cases where the urchins survived. So we tried to take that out of it, but um, there may still be something there that the urchins may not have just been as happy in Oyster Bay as they were in Alligator Harbor. So maybe they weren't feeding the same rate, but it could also be the fouling community. Why did Oyster Harbor fouling not have effect? And yeah, I think, and I think the same, yeah, it's the same point. Okay. <laughs> uh, and is there any taking a picture? This is time. there any amount of desiccation that urchins can withstand if farmers wanted to utilize this in the future? That that is a good question. I think that's going to vary by the urchin species. And I see another question about different type of organisms. And I think that's. It's worthwhile looking at because I thought this was a flyer. The idea of trying urchins, could this actually have an impact? And when it did, um, it certainly makes me think that we should be looking at other things that we could put in bags um, that might be able to help with this. Um, I've got other questions. Bill, can I say one? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, when we um, brought the urchins out of the water with Dr. Watts, the urchins were so sensitive that they actually brought oxygen stones to place the urchins in specific buckets. Right. So desiccation with urchins is uh, very delicate. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So actually, you know, 
I, I'm glad to keep answering questions, but we wanted to, uh, it's uh, 10, 10 51 and we got to keep it to an hour because Beth promised. Uh, yes, you know, so, you know me. Um, also just want to throw it open to not just asking about urchins, but any of our speakers. I, I don't know if Brendan's still on. Brendan had a yeah, flight to catch. Yeah, okay. Okay. We don't know how right. if anybody has any other questions for Adrian or for Brendan, um, yeah. maybe I'll mind if we can field anything. Them. Yeah, at this point, I would say let's open it up to any other questions. So um, if y'all have those, do you want to have them put them in the chat? What's the most efficient, do you think? Uh, yeah, or raise yeah, your hand. You could raise your hand too with a little, you know, the little icon thing or actually wave your hands. Anticipation. Let's see. And while, so uh, Shelly was asking about, oh, yeah, you know, Shelly, again, yeah. we will have to sort of explore how much they can take. When, oh, I would say read the how question. Much how much, the question was how much desiccation can urchins take? And I think that's something we have to explore. I just know that Dr. Watts freaked out when I showed him that some of the treatments were supposed to be flipping the oysters. So uh, to dry them. Okay. So Daniel Lewis, I'm gonna unmute you. Oh, hey, Chef Dan. Yeah, you, go ahead. Hey, how are you? Hey, Morning. good to see you. Good. Um, I know uh, commercially, the only sea urchin that's really uh, uh, available on uh, other than the West Coast is uh, um, out of Maine. Is that gonna be the same species as uh, was done with the test? No, we used a different one, but um, I've forgotten now which, which one is used in Maine, but Dr. Watts has taken these uh, to chefs and got very positive feedback. He's worked with this variety in the Gulf uh, extensively. And so there are a number of folks in Birmingham that have given him some pretty strong positive feedback about it. In fact, I think if Kanan's still on the call, as soon as, uh, as, soon as this study was done, Kanan was getting a text message asking when, when the uh, chef could get these in his, in his restaurant. I love it. It's, you wanna see if he's on? Kanan, are you on? Hey, Kanan, Oyster Homie, I, are you I on? Haven't, I haven't seen him. Uh, Okay. I thought I saw him earlier. Came, but... came and went. All right. That's all right. Question. Let's see. Urchin populations. And Steve, we'll oh, check. Okay. We'll check to see what the. I I doubt that there are native uh, endogenous urchin populations in Louisiana because of the low salinity. I, they are very sensitive to salt. Did you answer so. Leslie's question? Leslie. Les Leslie. Lee. Yes, I did. Okay, you did. did. Okay, great. So. Uh, we also wanted to throw out while we have some time, like uh, so, and we're not going to say the the c word um, oh, because no. because that's no. a that's a bummer. But uh, has anybody over the last year has anybody found uh, discovered or rediscovered a favorite food or drink um, that they want to share? Uh, anything that uh, you're like, oh, there's Eric saying thank you. But oh, thanks, uh, Eric. Figure this was uh, if you haven't been working out, you've been eating and drinking, or maybe maybe working out yeah. and eating and drinking. Yeah, that's why you work out <laughs> is so you can eat and drink. You know, come on. <laughs> oh, and y'all don't have to answer if you don't want to we're just throwing out a fun a fun question um but you know while y'all um think of it we just want to wrap up real quick mm -hmm. and just thank everybody again you know for hopping on today and kind of just getting in crazy town with us and seeing how this works i guess maybe by a quick show of hands i mean are people and you don't have and don't lie i mean did, were y'all happy with this i mean was it thumbs up kind of like uh not sure okay awesome okay good <laughs> by the way i've got to share that some people have some great answers lots and lots of salsa pickling mary smith is pickling mary and uh, smith. Yeah, that's great oh, pickling and it. fermenting Crock-pot cooking, of course. Yeah, we all love it. Eating our weight pot. in sea clouds. I love it. Instapot, which I discovered is actually like a misnomer. <laughs> it's olives. not really instant, but, you know, there you go. <laughs> Gosh. Well, you know, again, well, if people are still putting things Jefferson's in. Jefferson's bourbon. Just, just get on, you know, get on your calendar for next month. We're going to do this um, Friday, the next one. Friday, March 19th, the same time. Um, and we're going to be discussing sustainable packaging and try to squeeze in some three minute tech talks, which will be exactly three minutes. Um, you know, and the one after that is in April on April 16th, but we'll, you know, give another reminder yeah. for that again. Um, yeah, just, I would just say the three minute tech talks, if you have ideas, you can email me, uh, yeah, email Bill Walton at auburn.edu and I'll try to help coordinate sure, that. Or for, if you know, you want to email me to whatever, you could email Bill, that's fine. We can start looking at those and y'all can start thinking of your three minute tech talk. So um, we'll just be mindful of everybody's time. And if y'all want to turn your cameras on real quick, just see everybody's faces. <laughs> I was taking, I was taking pictures before. I'm going to do it again when everybody gets, I'm, I'm that kind of person, you know, so 
just appreciate everybody taking the time. Oh, hey, Ryan. Oh my gosh. We just miss everybody. I'm going to start to get mushy. I don't want to have it get too out of hand, but just we miss everyone. And thank you so much for taking the time to hop on. And we know fingers crossed next year, we'll be getting together in person. So just thank you again. And y'all have a great day, a Friday weekend, everything. Just mwah, we love you. <laughs> Thanks for hopping on. Thanks all. Thanks everybody. Oh, babies. Look. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> And thank you, Adrienne and Brendan. Thank you for your talks. Appreciate it. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. If anyone's got applied research that they think should be in a seminar, please let me know. Let's get it out to growers that can use it. We'd love to love to know what's going on. All right. Oh, yeah. It's so fun. What do you think? <laughs>